Savior. It is so exciting for you guys to be with us. We are glad you are here. You know what? On this special morning, we just got to recognize moms. To all of our moms out there, happy Mother's Day. Mom, I love you. What a blessing you all are to us. So happy Mother's Day. Hey, as always, we've got a lot going on uh, digitally, so check us out, OurSaviorFL.org. Lots of things going on throughout the week. With that being said, let us go ahead and begin our service this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Great things. 
great things. Yes, Lord.
God, Heavenly Father, Lord, it is only you. It is only you that we turn to. And Lord, I pray that we would turn to you, that we would know that you are present with us no matter where we are, that you would focus our hearts, you would focus our minds on you here today. In your name we pray, amen. You know, as we sang that song, that idea that God is enough, that God is good enough, that God is what we need, boy, that really, it reminded me of Matthew chapter four, the story where Jesus is in the desert and Satan comes to tempt him. He's fasted for 40 days and it said he was hungry. And every time I read that, I think, well, yeah, like during this quarantine, I have found that it's been like an hour and I'm like, well, time to go back to the fridge and check out what's in here. Gotten a little peckish again, right? After 40 days, it says Jesus is hungry. And so Satan comes to him and says, you're Jesus. Why don't you turn these stones into bread? You know, Jesus was just yearning for some bread. He was dying to have something to eat. He had this need inside of him. What's your bread? What do you know you shouldn't do, but still you feel this desire to give in? What is the bread in your life that you so desperately are tempted by? Maybe it's some selfish desire. Maybe it's to look a certain way, to act a certain way, to do a certain thing. What is the bread in your life that keeps tempting you, that you're just yearning to give into? That's our confession, isn't it? That we have these temptations in life that, man, they just eat away at us. And during this time where there's so much chaos, where it feels like there's no constant, it's so much easier to try and give into those things. What's your bread? But see, Jesus' response to Satan in that moment, he says, for man does not live on bread alone, but from every word from the mouth of God. We don't live on the temptations of this world because as I just said, I'll go to the fridge, have myself a feast, and an hour later, there I stand yet again looking and saying, well, what else is in here? Because that's the nature of the temptation of this world. It keeps eating away at us. But the word of God, the word of God is true and will never fade away. And the word of God says, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Let's show God that his grace is sufficient for us. Let's show God that we don't just believe, we don't just know, but we have faith in his word. Let's go to him and bring our sin and lay it at his feet to trust that his love will overcome that, to trust that his grace will wash that away, to trust that God can and will forgive us. Let's take a moment now, wherever you may be, however you may be watching this, let's take a moment, just you and him. Ask for his love and his grace in this time. There is nothing better than God. Another word from the mouth of God is for God. So love the whole world, everybody in it, that he gave his son, willingly sacrificed his own flesh and blood, his self, he gave himself so that no one would have to perish, that whoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. See, that is the grace that God offers to us. That is the love that God offers to you. And it's with that love in mind that I have the privilege and honor to say to you here now, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And now in response to that grace, in response to that love, to that mercy, to that forgiveness, let's sing together, let's worship our King.
high that the highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me.
Hey, good morning, our Savior. Once again, to all of our moms out there, I want to say happy Mother's Day. Glad you are with us this morning. We are going to continue our sermon series entitled Closer Than You Think. It was W.C. Fields. He was a brilliant comedian and movie actor. He was not a man of faith, but as his life was coming to an end, one day he was found reading the Bible. And one of his friends came up to him and said, what are you doing? To which he responded humorously, I am looking for loopholes. I am looking for loopholes. You know what? No one has ever taught us how to look for a loophole. We just seem to know how to do it naturally, don't we? Loopholes are ways around the rules without technically breaking that rule. A loophole is exploiting the ambiguity or the inadequacy of a law or a set of rules. I mean, for instance, your mom says, clean your plate. And you give your plate to the dog, and the dog licks it clean. You cleaned your plate. Or your parents tell you, be home at 9. Well, you know what? That's just so vague, isn't it? 9 a.m. or 9 p.m.? 9 on Tuesday or 9 on Wednesday? I mean, loopholes. And when religious people exploit loopholes, we call them hypocrites, right? And for religious leaders who exploit the loopholes, Jesus had a specific term for them. He called them whitewashed tombs. Oh, they could look beautiful and ornate on the outside, but the inside was full of rot and stench and decay. Of all the sins, none aroused the fiery indignation of Jesus more than hypocrisy. And so if you just absolutely positively do not like hypocrisy, well then you know what? You have something in common with Jesus. This morning we're going back to the Gospel of Mark. Specifically, we're going to be in chapter 7. So go ahead and open up your Bibles. But just as some background information, remember Simon Peter? He was one of the top two disciples along with John. Peter was probably one of the most famous apostles. He was an eyewitness. He heard and saw with his own eyes the preaching and the teaching of Jesus. He witnessed Jesus arrested. He saw Jesus die upon the cross, and he interacted with the resurrected Christ. For 30 years after the resurrection, Peter went all around proclaiming the gospel message on how Jesus died for our sins and he rose again, that we could be forgiven, that we could have the hope and the assurance of everlasting life. For 30 years, Peter preached the gospel. He's somewhere in his mid-50s. He's in Nero's Rome. He's imprisoned. And he doesn't know it yet, but he will never be released. He will be executed for his faith. John Mark, one of his traveling companions, is with him. John Mark had traveled with Peter for quite some time. He heard Peter, Peter preach and teach. And now, now he's documenting Peter's experiences with Jesus. It's interesting, when you look at the gospel according to Mark, there are some words that jump out at you, like the word immediately. Peter constantly uses the word immediately. See, the gospel according to Mark is a very fast-moving gospel. And so let's delve in once again to chapter 1. Jesus went into Galilee, that is northern Israel around the Sea of Galilee, and he was proclaiming the good news of God. And what was that good news? The time has come, he said. In other words, don't miss it. The wait is over. What you've been looking for, what you've been waiting for has finally arrived. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. In other words, the kingdom is here. The king has arrived. The king is here. And the only appropriate response is repent and believe the good news. Now that word repent means that you do a 180. If you're walking in this direction, you are going to stop and you are going to turn and go in the exact opposite direction. And so what Peter was saying, what Jesus was proclaiming in the good news is repent and believe. In other words, turn away from your old way of life. Turn your life into the, into the, the direction of this good news. Turn your life to the king. In other words, face and embrace the king. It's interesting. When you look at the Gospels, Jesus became upset when religion, when man-made laws, when man-made regulations became a barrier to a relationship with God. 
I mean, that's when Jesus became indignant. That's when Jesus became extremely upset. Last week, we looked at Mark chapter 2, where Jesus and his disciples, they're walking through some grain fields. His disciples were hungry, and so they picked a couple heads of grain. According to Jewish law, that was considered harvesting. They were breaking Jewish law. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, they called Jesus and his disciples out. Why are you breaking this law? To which Jesus responded, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. I mean, that was a controversial statement right there. Jesus was saying that that the Sabbath was made for man. You know, in Mark chapter 3, Jesus walked once again on the Sabbath. There was a man with a lame hand, and and Jesus simply said, stretch out your hand, and the man was healed. As Pastor Futch so boldly and eloquently said last Sunday, God loves people far more than man-made traditions and laws and regulations. For the Son of Man did not come into the world to judge the world, but to save the world. When you look at the Gospel of Mark, crowds of people began to follow Jesus. Jesus calls the 12 disciples to follow him. In Mark chapter 3, the scripture tells us that that Jesus entered a house. He's in Capernaum. And again, a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. I mean, there were so many people pressing in around him. There was so much activity, so much commotion going on that Jesus and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family who were some 40 miles away in Nazareth, heard about this, heard about all the activity and how Jesus was working so diligently, so hard, they went to take charge of him, for they said he is out of his mind. You see, his family traveled 40 miles because they thought that possibly Jesus was going to burn out. You see, his teaching was so different, was so disruptive to the the way that people were thinking at that time that the teachers of the law who had come down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. They had a completely and totally different focus. But what was happening was the excitement was building. There was energy and the crowds were growing and growing. Jesus fed the 5,000 and that's 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. Jesus could have fed as many as 15 to 20,000 people. In Mark chapter 6, it says that as soon as they got out of the boat, Jesus and his disciples, they jumped into the boat to go find a place to relax, to have some peace, to rejuvenate. But as soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region, and they carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. They were anticipating Jesus' movements. And people were coming from all around the region to hear Jesus preach, to have Jesus heal their sick. And wherever he went, into villages and towns and countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. I mean, it was amazing. I bet as Peter was recalling this, he had this big smile on his face. I mean, this was the pinnacle of his popularity. There was all kinds of energy, all kinds of excitement, all kinds of activity going on. People were taking notice. The movement was gaining all kinds of momentum. But other people were taking notice as well. In Mark chapter 7, Peter recalls the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees were those religious leaders who followed the strictest outward observance of the law. They had this hollow formalism. They were self-righteous, and they looked down upon everyone. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. I mean, that's amazing. Think about this. So this delegation from Jerusalem probably some hand-picked Pharisees and teachers of the law. These were people who were well-educated, people who, who the, the other Pharisees thought the, re, the ruling religious body would think could hold their ground with Jesus. 
They traveled six or seven days all the way from Jerusalem, some hundred miles on foot to Galilee. They were watching Jesus. They were thinking, well, maybe they can just disrupt his teaching. Maybe they could discredit Jesus and the people wouldn't follow him. Or maybe they were looking for Jesus to break some law so that they could press charges against him. And so they were watching Jesus. They gathered around Jesus and they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled. That is unwashed. The New Testament is written in Greek. The Greek word for defiled is koine. It simply means common hands. They were not hands that were set aside. They were not holy hands. They were just common hands. That is unwashed. You see, what's happening here is Jesus and the religious elite, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're headed for a head-on collision. A head-on collision between authenticity and that which is false. Mark goes on to explain what's taking place. He says that the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. So the Pharisees had such influence that all the Jews, I mean the vast majority of Jews, would follow their teaching, would follow their modeling. And so they would not eat unless they gave their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. You see, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they had rules. They had a system. They had a tradition that had to be followed. The tradition of the elders, it goes all the way back to the book of Exodus, When God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, Moses went up on Mount Sinai. God gave him Ten Commandments written on two stone tablets. But it was the myth, and that's exactly what it was, a myth, that God also gave Moses the oral law or the oral tradition. That God not only gave Moses written law, but he also gave Moses an oral law. And that oral law was passed on from generation to generation to generation. And the oral law just grew and grew and grew. And it became so large that they couldn't even keep control of it. They couldn't keep track of it. In the early 200s, between 200 and 220 AD, they put it down in writing called the Mishnah. It was all of these rules, all of these laws that would protect the written law. You see, what they did was they put a fence around the law. They made all of these additional laws, all of these additional restrictions so that you would not even get close to breaking the law. Uh, For instance, there are 30 chapters in the Mishnah that deal with ritualistic washing. I mean, Jesus in, in the Gospel of Matthew said it like this. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. In other words, the Pharisees, the religious elite, they made these man-made religious barriers that prevented people from having a relationship with God. They were focused on law. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? I don't know, I I think Peter was, oh, this is going to be good. Let's see what Jesus says. Let's see how Jesus responds. And Jesus responds, I can picture it being very quickly. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. Ooh, I mean, those are some powerful words. Jesus just called the religious leaders hypocrites. What I find interesting is Jesus went immediately to Scripture. Jesus went immediately to God's word, to the prophet Isaiah, for it is written. This was not oral tradition. This was God's word. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, Thy word is truth. From Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. Thy word is truth. And Jesus turned immediately 
to the inspired, inerrant word of God. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips. He's quoting Isaiah chapter 29. They honor me with my lips. It's so true, isn't it? Us religious people, we know the right words to say. We know how to talk the talk, but it doesn't necessarily mean we walk the walk. They know the right words to say, but their hearts are far from me. I mean, their hearts are so hardened. They are so unprepared to see the king. Their hearts are so far from him that they won't even recognize him when he's standing right before them. They worship me in vain. I mean, their, their worship is empty. Their teachings are mere human rules. And then Jesus went on to say, you have let go of the commands of God and you are grasping onto, you're embracing, you're holding on to human traditions. And he continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. In other words, you developed all of these loopholes. And all of these loopholes are self-serving. All of these loopholes, all of these rules and regulations that you developed are for your own benefit. And then Jesus gives them an example. I mean, he really drives the point home. He goes on to say, For Moses said, Moses was God's prophet. Moses was God's spokesman, his right-hand man. For Moses said, and this is not the oral law, this is written down, Honor your father and mother. You know that as being the fourth commandment. Written in Exodus chapter 20, Honor your father and your mother. But then Jesus also goes on to quote Exodus chapter 21. Anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. You see, what Jesus is teaching is that this is no minor infraction. We're called to honor our mother and our father. I bet once again, as Peter was recalling what Jesus taught, his experiences with Jesus, I bet he had a smile on his face. Because Peter... Peter knows the end of the story. He heard Jesus teaching. He saw Jesus die and rise again from the dead. Peter knows at this point, as he reflects back, that Jesus is greater than Moses, that the king is here. Peter was there on the mount when Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. I bet he didn't understand it at that point, but as he thought back on it, now he fully understands it. Jesus was saying, all authority, I am sovereign. I am the one in charge. I control all things in heaven and on earth. All authority is mine. I'm the boss. I bet Peter recalled that last Passover when Jesus said, a new commandment that I give you, love one another as I have loved you. We're called to love one another. That's not just emotionally. That's a decision of, of, of commitment. Love is an action. Love is something that we do. We're called to love one another. We're called to love our mothers. And we're called to love our fathers sacrificially. See, Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, I mean, Jesus is directly contrasting Scripture with human law and human tradition. But you say your oral tradition, your oral Torah, that if anyone declares, that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is, devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or their mother. Now you have to go, what in the world is he talking about? You see, back in the first century, taking care of aging parents, I mean, it was difficult. I mean, just as it is today, back in the first century, it was expensive. It was time-consuming. And what the Pharisees and the religious leaders did is they found a loophole. They found a workaround, a fix. And it was called korban. See, what korban was is they took all of their possessions, they took their money, they took their, ma ma their material possessions, and they devoted them to God. They gave them to the temple. But you see, it was a deferred gift. 
They could continue to use that money. They would continue to have control of that money. They could do with it whatever they wanted to do. But when someone came up to them and asked for help, or when their parents needed assistance, they could simply say, well, I would love to help you, but all of my money, all of my possessions are korban. They've all been uh, designated, devoted to God. You see, it made them look good on the outside. It made them look pious in the eyes of men, but their hearts were hard, and the inside did not change. It was full of stench and rot and decay. This hypocrisy was just infuriating to Jesus. They were elevating the traditions of men over the word of God. Now, before we judge them too harshly, okay, let me ask you, okay, let, let's bring this home. Let's make this into a modern-day example. Have you ever sinned? Have you ever given offense, caused offense, hurt somebody else? Where by your words or by your actions, you hurt them. You caused offense to them. And you even know it. And maybe that relationship is estranged. Maybe that relationship is hurting right now. And you took your, uh, your sin to God. You went to God. You confessed your sin. You confessed your wrongdoing. But then you didn't go back and make it right with that person. I mean... I've done it. People come immediately to mind. And then we do all of these mental gymnastics, don't we? I mean, I could get a gold medal in mental gymnastics. We, we come up with all of these reasons why we should not go back and make things right with that person. I mean, Jesus said, when you go to the altar to give your gift and you recognize the fact that you caused offense with somebody, he said, go and make peace with that person. And then come back and offer your gift. I mean, see, we can look like little angels on the outside, can't we? Uh, that's me. That's my bald spot there in the back of my head, just so you can know it's me. I mean, on the outside, we can look good. On the outside, we can make it look like we've got everything together. Even look a little pious. But in reality, what's inside is hard-hearted. We're called to love God. And we love God by loving other people and by serving the world. See, Jesus told the Pharisees and the Sadducees, you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and you do many things like that. And all of a sudden, it was like he was done talking to the Pharisees. He turned around, he walked away, and he addressed the crowd that was with him. Later on, Peter recalls that Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, which you got to say, no kidding. I mean, Jesus, every time you interacted with them, you showed them up, you humiliated them. You even did it in public. I mean, maybe Peter and the other disciples were thinking, Jesus, we need to make friends in Jerusalem. I mean, Jesus, we need to make friends. We need some people in high places. We need to know some influential people that can stand up and defend us. But Jesus would not stop. He would not stop standing for the word of God and for truth. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were leading people away from the truth. All of the Old Testament was pointing to the coming Messiah. All of the Old Testament is pointing to Jesus. And yet they corrupted the entire system. Everything that was designed to point to Jesus, they corrupted. And they were turning people away. They were leading people away from the way, the truth, and the life that was Jesus. So let's take this home, okay? And, and this morning, I'm hoping you have one of those aha kind of moments. This makes sense. I can see it. But let me ask you some questions. Have you ever let go I mean, is it a possibility? Just only between you and God. I mean, have you ever let go of the commands of God for human tradition? Have you come up with your own loopholes? Have you developed your own fine print? Okay, so I'm going to ask you some difficult questions here. They're going to make you a little bit uncomfortable. And I need to admit, I've been caught with my hand in the cookie jar. I'm guilty. I'm right there with you. 
All right, so here we go. Do you ever try to figure how close you can get to sin without sinning? Have you ever done that? You try to figure out just how close can I get to sin without sinning? See, I've got a gift. I can rationalize and I can justify just about anything. But have you ever done that? Have you ever tried to see just how close you can get to sin without sinning? I mean, maybe it's the restaurant. You know, you, you get a, a, a glass for water, and you can rationalize it, and you justify it. It doesn't cost that much, and you take the Diet Coke instead. Or maybe there are no refills, and yet you constantly go up, and you're filling up your glass over and over again. Have you ever tried to justify what you put before your eyes? I mean, maybe you're watching one of those television shows as you're binge-watching Netflix, or, or you got something on the computer screen. And you can justify it and you can rationalize it in your mind. Oh, it's just art. It's artistic quality. I mean, we can come up with all kinds of excuses, can't we? Justifying our actions. Do you realize how pharisaical that is? Do you realize just how small we make our God? How inconsequential we make the, the, the death of Jesus? How about this one? Do you believe that there is a ritual that makes you right with God while removing your responsibility to make things right with others. I mean, do you believe that if you cause offense, that there's something that you could just simply do, just by the act of doing it, it gets you off the hook? You know, maybe if you just go to church three times, or maybe if you just give a little bit more money, or maybe if you just do something, you think that it gets you off the hook. My friends, no games with God. We're guilty. All of us are guilty, and there are no excuses but see, God loves people more than he loves the man-made traditions and the laws. God loves you. And because you are loved, because you are forgiven, the question is this. What does God require or what does love require of me? Just a little bit later in Mark chapter 12, Peter recalls that greatest commandment. You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. You love the Lord your God with all of your being, and then you love your neighbor as yourself. That's the, the greatest commandment, love. St. Paul writes in Romans 13, 10 that love is fulfillment of the law. We're called to love. Just as God loved us, just as Jesus loved you, and he loved you so much, it was a, a love of tough decisions that drove him to the cross to follow the will of his father, to offer his very life as a sacrifice, to pay the debt, the penalty of our sin. But because he rose again from the grave, we know that we are forgiven. We know that everything he promises us will and is true. That one day we will stand before him in his kingdom. That you and I, we have the victory. We have everlasting life. And nothing and no one can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And my friends, his love is never far from us. He is right there with us every step of the way. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And so Peter and Mark would say, the time has come. The time is right now. The kingdom of God is here. Repent. Turn away from that old way of life. Turn to the new king, the king that is here. Face and embrace him. And believe the good news. You are loved. You are forgiven. And you and I, we're called to live loved. As we love Jesus, we love people, and we serve the world. Never forget, God is closer than you think. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, we come before you this morning, and we praise you for your grace. We praise you for that love that you showered down upon us. We did nothing to deserve it. We did nothing to earn it in, every, in any way. But yet, you love us. You forgive us. You restore us. Lord, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit at work in and through each and every one of us, that we may live loved. That we may love you with all of our being. That we may love our neighbors 
that we may serve. Lord, we come before your throne of mercy and grace this morning. We thank and we praise you for the physicians and the nurses, for all the medical teams, for their sacrifice and all that they're doing to to take care of those who are ill and hurt. We pray for the scientists and the researchers. We pray, Lord, for clarity. We pray for direction. We pray for a vaccine and for a cure. Lord, we just pray for your guidance and for your direction. That in all we do and all we say, that we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And this morning, we come before your throne of mercy and grace. And we pray that prayer that you yourself taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.